From the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology, this is the Bob Harrington Show. Dr. Robert Harrington is the Stephen and Suzanne Weiss Dean of Weill Cornell Medicine and Provost for Medical Affairs of Cornell University. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. Hi, this is Bob Harrington from Weill Cornell Medicine on Medscape Cardiology and the heart.org. Over the years, we've talked a lot on this show about randomized clinical trials. We talk about some of the latest research coming out of uh, observational analyses, outcomes-based research. And we've had discussions about which one is a better form of evidence. Is it or a stronger form of evidence? Is it the randomized clinical trial? Is it a well-done observational analysis? And the answer is, it depends. Uh, it depends what your question is. It depends the data sets that you're using. It depends how the trial was done. Uh, as Because what we're really trying to do is to understand whether or not we have reliable information coming out of a research study that allows us to d- make decisions about how we might be treating our patients. Um, this also involves things like causal inference, and uh, we're going to talk about that today. I can't think of a better person to have this conversation uh, with today uh, than my good friend and colleague, Dr. Bobby Ye from uh, Harvard. Bobby is the Kath Silver Family Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and he's also the director of the Richard and Susan Smith Center for Outcomes Research at the Beth Israel Leahy Medical Center in Boston. Bobby, thanks for joining us here on Medscape Cardiology. Thanks for having me, Bob. It's been a few years. You reminded me before we got on the air. And if I think about it, last time you and I talked, um, you were having a baby. And what did you say? You now have a five-year-old. I do. He's almost six. Yeah, so it's been a little bit. So it's been a while. And I think last time we talked is we talked about Twitter. You had written a paper. That's right. About democratization of uh, knowledge through uh, social media. Yeah, that's got a little sideways since that paper. (laughs) That definitely has gone a little sideways. (laughs) Well, you know, the, um, the reason I wanted to invite you to have to talk about this topic is uh, twofold, one of which is it's something that you and I have talked about a lot at medical meetings, at conferences, um, this whole notion of, you know, the strength of evidence and how do we assess evidence and what kind of level of evidence do we need. But you wrote a really important paper last summer, which is the second reason I invited you. It was called Bringing the Credibility Revolution to Observational Research in Cardiology. Uh, And I know you've talked with others about the topic, and I thought, you know what? It's still a pretty important topic. It was really important during COVID, wasn't it, Um, as people were trying to put forward all sorts of um, observational analyses to try to help us gain insight rapidly into what therapies might be of value. But thanks for joining me, and uh, let's maybe start with the biggest picture, Bobby. Why'd you write the paper? It's uh, a topic that that I've been thinking about for uh, many years, obviously, and, 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 and we've had many discussions over the years and, and our colleagues here have as well. It's, you know, it's, it's an area that we have, uh, do a lot of research in here, uh, which is how do we get more credible estimates out of our observational analyses for comparative effectiveness research? We have had a particular interest uh, in the past few years working with the FDA uh, and more recently CMS to understand the value of real world evidence. And I think it's a very polarizing topic. It's a topic that, that you can find people who, you know, swear that, that they'll never trust an observational study. And you find others who say that they really can believe the causal interpretability of a well-done observational study and, and very smart, reasonable people can disagree strongly on this issue. So I felt like there has been a real challenge that we faced in cardiology, really across medicine, but what I, you know, our field's cardiology. And I I felt there was time to to talk about at least some of the challenges and how we we might move that discussion forward. I think that's a really uh, nice way to sum it up. When you invited me to the Harvard School of Public Health last year to come attend a meeting on causal inference, I I felt like I was the sacrificial clinical trialist uh, walking into the lion's den, but actually, I think we all agreed on much more than we disagreed on. Yeah, I, I think that's that's right. I mean, I think under certain circumstances, r- randomized clinical trials give you the best answer. But I think we'd all agree also that we can't conduct trials 
for every question that we have. And that for some questions, particularly those that relate to understudied populations or how, how devices and therapies are working in actual practice, that we have to at least be able to understand some evidence from observational literature, that we can't just throw all of it out. Uh, we do so only at our own peril. Well, I fully agree with that. Um, while, while I like to think of myself as a trialist in many ways, uh, I'm a clinical researcher who uses the methods that are, uh, that are available and that might be best suited to answer that particular question. And if I think about my own body of work, there's a lot more that we've written that deals with non-randomized data than there is uh, when we've dealt with a specific randomized question. Because even within randomized clinical trials, there's a whole set of observational things that you do. Yeah. Bobby, now, one of the things I really enjoyed about the paper is it made me think about where people are using um, some of these techniques uh, in, a, in a very thoughtful, innovative, and maybe ways that we could learn from. Uh, and you particularly talk about economics and uh, economic policy. Talk about that a little bit, particularly for the cardiology reader who yeah. might not be thinking about the economic literature. Maybe when I started thinking about these issues, you know, really as a fellow um, trying to understand observational research methods. This was when I was a fellow at UCSF. I had a lecture on instrumental variable analysis. And I was, I was really struck by the potential power of these. And then when I looked into it a little bit more, I started to understand that, boy, you know, instrumental variable analysis is something that all cardiologists should really have a deep understanding of because the best instrumental variable analysis is really the randomized clinical trial. Yet, very few cardiologists, cardiovascular investigators utilize observational approaches with instrumental variable analysis. And actually, very few clinical trialists really apply true IV studies uh, approaches to their RCTs, which actually is a whole different potential topic of conversation. So when I got back here as an interventional fellow, I was really having trouble like understanding one particular question actually in, in sort of an esoteric question. And I sent an email to this guy who had written papers on this, this guy, Josh Angrist. He was an MIT professor. He was just across one stop on the red line from Mass General, where I was at the time. Um, he's at the Kendall Square T-stop, which you know well. And I had lunch with him. The conversation we had at lunch was just really eye-opening. So fast forward a decade, a little bit more than a decade later, and Josh received the Nobel Prize in economics. So professor, I should say, the four professor of economics, Joshua Angris, I'm calling him Josh. Uh, and he received that Nobel Prize because he really discovered how to apply these quasi-experimental methods to understand labor economics, charter school policies, you know, things that, that we don't really study that much, but but have this confounding issue that is, I think, subject to a lot of, you know, challenges, a lot of medical studies, which is people who opt into charter schools or people who opt into certain economic policies are not, they don't randomly opt in. And he had figured out that, you know, we can find these experiments, these natural experiments, uh, instrumental variables, and really understand the effects of policy. It was a great example of where there was very low credibility in economic studies for comparative effectiveness or causal inference uh, back then. And he, David Card, and Guido Imbens, the three of them together really revolutionized that field. And that's the kind of revolution that we're in need of in cardiology. Let's unpack that a little bit. And the first thing to unpack is describe for people what makes for a good observational study, if one wants to draw causal inference. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, and I've spoken a little bit about the econometric methods and my epidemiology colleague would say, oh, you, they would they'd listen to this and they would be turning over because they would say I'm putting too much, uh, too much weight on those. Because the first starting point is common to whatever approach you do, which is actually identifying and specifying, clearly stating what the question is. And actually, this, this seems, it's harder than we think it is. Sometimes we say, oh, I'm just comparing A versus B, but then you look at the details of what you actually set up in observational analysis you didn't quite do what you think you did. And so what, what most investigators will say now, including Miguel Hernan, who's really, I think, pioneered a lot of this thinking, and that you met at our causal inference seminar yeah. you know, last year, he, he said, think of the theoretical clinical trial that you want to run, the randomized clinical trial, and then everything about your observational analysis 
should follow from how you do it, including the eligibility criteria, the hypothesis, the outcomes, how you're ascertaining those things. And if you approach an observational study in the way that we approach with the same rigor that we design a randomized clinical trial, then we won't make mistakes, silly mistakes that can cause problems. So that's the starting point. After that, I think you have to think really clearly, it's something that we've talked about a lot, about the data set and whether the data set is fit for purpose for the study that you're trying to do. And for me, that means understanding whether or not the device or the treatment is well measured, the outcome is well measured, and then maybe most importantly, do you have all of the potential confounders? Often the answer to that question is no. And the answer should be, you shouldn't proceed with that analysis. You had a conversation on this topic with uh, John Mandrola, and there was a fascinating set of, uh, of comments after the presentation, including from uh, someone I suspect you know well, my former Duke colleague, uh, Frank Harrell, uh, from whom I learned a lot over the years when I was a... Uh, uh, when I was a cardiology fellow in what was then called the Duke Data Bank. And what Frank said in one of his comments, which sounds, I could hear his voice. He's, Frank said, what you ought to be doing is getting 10 experts and asking them all the things that, you know, that they think about when they're selecting a therapy or a technique or a technology. And if you have measured all those things, then you can proceed. And that's essentially what you're saying. It's, it's so interesting, too, that that's coming from, from Frank. A statistician, because what I think what what many of us and investigators think is this is a problem that can be solved with statistics, and it, it it's actually not. It's no. a problem that is solved by asking clinicians who make those decisions every day. A statistician can do you know many things, but what a statistician can't do is tell you whether or not the data set captures the important clinical confounders. That's a clinician's job. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it reminded me of the best part of uh, being a fellow in the Duke Data Bank was Tuesday Research Conference, when the statisticians, the clinicians, all of us as fellows would get together to uh, uh, talk about work in progress, uh, sometimes work that was pretty evolved in progress. But the conversations were always about, well, tell me, Bob, why they, why did you pick angioplasty for this patient? And uh, because it, it's trying to get to your point, which is that, what were the things that made you think about the choice of one therapy over another? And is there a certain set of those things that we can all agree upon and then proceed? And, and as you've said, if we can't come up with that list, or if we come up with a list and you realize that your data set is woefully lacking, you probably ought to stop. But people don't stop, do they? Yeah, they, they, they rarely do. Uh, they usually press forward and then they'll have it as a line in the limitation section which is, and we can't rule out confounding as a possible explanation. The problem with that is that's like a get out, get out of jail free card. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's sometimes you read the study and you say, this is impossibly confounded. And your limitation is actually the primary conclusion of the paper. If there's a strong possibility or probability that your single greatest limitation entirely overturns your study, you ought to think twice about whether or not that's a study worthwhile. Now I will say also, that these quasi-experimental approaches that we started with in the econometric methods don't hinge on the unmeasured confounder assumption. They are useful when the data set doesn't capture the measured confounders and you can't do a direct sort of A versus B comparison. That's an important observation. And the, the, the really unfortunate thing is that most people, and I think Frank noted this in his comments, he said the good researchers are not the ones that I'm worried about because they are doing the things that Frank thinks are important and that you've already laid out. It's it's the not so good researchers who were trying to get an answer out there and are many times haven't pre-specified what they're going to do. You know, in, in a clinical trials, we, we we go through a great deal of mental anguish around what's the order in which, for example, you're going to um, analyze your secondary endpoints in order to sort of protect the type one error. And you declare it, you put your nickel down and you follow it. And if you, you know, particularly if you're doing things like sequential testing and you say, or hierarchical testing, you say, okay, I, I got through these three, the p-values are what I said they would be to be to achieve statistical significance. And now I have one that's above that threshold. Everything else is exploratory. Yeah. And, and, and you have to say it. Yeah, you have to declare those things. And, and we, we ought to be doing more of that 
pre-specification and declaration and registration and statistical analysis plans for observational studies in the same way. They can be done in the same way. They're not unique to trials. It just so happens that that's become standard operating procedure for trials, and it hasn't been for observational data. Why, why do you think that is? I mean, you know, the, the people have talked, you know, clinicaltrials.gov, where we're all required to put our clinical trials uh, plans online. Uh, to give people a chance to, uh, to to make sure that we haven't changed our minds during the course of the study, um, that we did what we said we were going to do. Or what, what's the saying? You you know, say what you're going to do and do what you said. Yeah. And that's what you should be doing. How come we don't do that in uh, with observational reports? It's a great question. I, I think it has to do with how discipline, how much discipline it takes to do it. It, it requires quite a bit of discipline to do it for randomized clinical trials, but it's become the expectation for trials. So now it's, you know, if you didn't do those things, the journal might not accept that trial. Whereas for the observational study, it just hasn't been the expectation in part because it's so much easier to conduct observational studies. Here, you know, this is one of the things, it, it gets into the debate about, about data sharing and, and, and access. You know, part of the challenge of having data that are so widely available, it's obviously a, a, a good thing, Data are so vi widely available, it's democratized in a sense, but it also makes it just easier to get away with bad quality studies. Whereas large scale randomized clinical trials are confined to a few, you know, a handful of investigators like yourself and other big research groups like DCRI, the BAME Institute, like Mike Gibson runs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the downside of that is it's, it's not really a level playing field for being able to conduct those. The, the, the positive side is that there is a common understanding of the rigor with which it takes to, to run those trials because there's this barrier to entry. Imagine it became incredibly easy for every investigator uh, to run a randomized clinical trial. You might not see the same rigor of those trials as you do now for the major trials that we see. Uh, although you've heard me talk that what I want to see is it made a lot easier to do randomized yeah. clinical trials so that we can constantly, you know, the world I want to live in is one that if we don't know the answer, that somehow we're being randomized uh, to be able to get some insight into what that answer might be. Um, and I'm willing to accept a little messiness yeah. uh, in order to have more questions exposed to the rigor of randomization. Yeah. Let, let me go back and ask you, you know, I was just thinking about the Duke Data Bank days, which really started um, as observational outcomes analysis, right? With the uh, with the collection of, uh, of all the coronary disease patients at Duke. Do you make your fellows write a research plan as to what they're going to do when they're, they, they show up in the Smith Center and they want to they wanna do what you want to do? We do. We have a, a, a form uh, uh, that they are to fill out. They meet with the uh, statistician to discuss what they've written. Um, and, and, and we, you know, iterate on that and then we decide on something, you know, um, that's pretty standard for us. You know, I, I'd say, do we take it to the top? Do we register every study? No, we don't register every study, but important ones we do. Things that we think will, are impactful for regulatory science, we certainly do it. And there are a couple of yeah. examples of that, that we've done with the FDA recently that we did that for. Um, but, you know, we try to hold ourselves to as high a standard as we can, but it's, it's easy to fall short of that, for sure. It's easy to want to take just another peek under the hood a little bit and yeah. tweak a model just a little different way to get the result that you want. But you know, in a, in a perfect world, you, that's why it takes a lot of planning up front. You really want to be able to sort of go to bed at night feeling good about the study that you're putting forward. If it was a rigorous examination of the question. Yep. One of the things that I really enjoyed in your paper, um, those of us who are journal editors spend a lot of time making sure that there's no causal inference language in, the, uh, in some of these analyses. Yeah. In, in your paper here, you tell me that's a cop out. Um, that, that it sort of, it gives us license to say, okay, um, we know that there's limitations here, so uh, go ahead and say what you want. You think that that's not good enough to just take out the causal language. In fact, I think you said somewhere in here, maybe we should have the causal language in there, yeah. but tell us how you got there. Yeah, yeah I think I, I, that's exactly right, in my opinion. Now, now this is controversial. I was at- Well, I know, that's I why I brought it up. I was at a meeting, TCT, and I said that from the podium, and Stuart Pocock, he, he almost stood up and interrupted me. And he said, you know, no, 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 we, we cannot do that. Um, so this is controversial for sure. And, and the, the point of that is this. I don't think that every observational study ought to be 
interpret it causally. No, just the opposite. I think only a very small minority should be interpreted causally. But when the intent is causal, we ought to be upfront about that. When we say, oh, this is associated with that, wink, wink, nod, nod, we know what we're sort of getting at. Our point is, and, and so we ought to acknowledge that. And if we acknowledge that, that our, our goal here was to study the causal impact of this treatment for this condition compared to some other condition, then all of a sudden, boy, I better clear a high bar then. I got to convince you. And once you know that that's my intent, I think the likelihood that I convince you is going to be low. But if I do convince you, I ought to be able to say that, that we ought to acknowledge that you've been convinced. Now, what that will mean to me is fewer observational studies being published, but raising the quality of observational studies, being more explicit about the intent of it. And, yeah. and I think overall that will improve the quality. You know, a, a few months ago, I was I met with a, a couple of investigators that we did a show. Um, I think it was at AHA where we talked about the publisher parish, and that's part of the challenge, right? Is that there's a lot of journals. I think you mentioned that there's a lot of things that people want to say. People need to start developing their research chops, their reputation, and so unfortunately, we are in in some ways we we created this mess, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I see a lot of trainees just like you and, and many others who are listening to this. And, you know, sometimes I steer them away from those causal comparative effectiveness studies for their first ones because they're, they're controversial. They're sometimes difficult to interpret. You know, there's other observational studies, descriptive epidemiology, prediction modeling, risk factor assessment. Those things are important observational studies that don't rely quite on the same extent of assumptions that a comparative effect in the study does. And yeah. sometimes those are really good studies for trainees to work on. People will often ask me, you know, which, which one do you, do you, do you like, you know, to answer your question, randomized trial or a uh, observational analysis. I said, well, tell me what your question is and tell me what data it is that you're going to use and tell me what you're trying to ultimately get at. Do you want to make causal inference? If you want to make causal inference, and it's possible to do a clinical trial, a randomized clinical trial, that's what you ought to do. Yeah. Uh, but if that's not your goal, there's a lot of other ways to, uh, uh, to, to put forward some, some thoughts into the, into the literature um, and use some different methods. Bobby, if, if, I, if I gave you the power to do one thing to make the field better, what would you do? Gosh, um, it, it's, a, it's a, got me on the spot here, but I would say that, if we could standardize and even just make modern methods for causal inference more widely known and understood in our community, in the journals, in the scientific community, in the readers, I think many of these challenges would not go away entirely, but we'd be much better off. Yeah, and in, in some ways, that's what we've done in clinical trials, isn't it? We've standardized a lot of what we do, including the reporting of results, et cetera, in a way with the consort diagrams, for example, that really helps us think through what it is that we set out to do. And then, you know, what did we do? Um, and then reporting it, you know, in, in, in as full a fashion as is humanly possible. Bobby, thank you for joining us here in Medscape Cardiology. This has been a, a fun conversation with my friend and colleague, Bobby Ye from, uh, from Beth Israel Deaconess. Bobby is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and he's the director of the uh, Richard and Susan Smith Outcomes Center at, at BI. So, Bobby, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Bobby.